All right, welcome to our ICD-10 and Metasoft training today where we're focusing on billing challenges surrounding ICD-10 and the solutions that are available to you in Metasoft. Just to introduce myself, my name is Lori Olson and I'll be your trainer and host today. I've been with ASCOMP since 2001. I'm a member of the Metasoft Product Advisory Board. Uh, my pride and joy are my two little miracles at home. We were able to, after 13 years um, of marriage, adopt our sons. And my other favorite thing to do is to take pictures of all the naughtiness that they get into. I do happen to love mud, so um, they kind of have that same joy for it. And that was one of their recent little mud fights there. And I'm always there with my camera getting every little second of it for them. So. What we're going to cover today, again, is focusing on Metasoft and ICD-10. However, I do want to reiterate that this is not ICD-10 coding training. So we will not be covering how to properly code using ICD-10 or anything to do with like medical necessity or anything like that. We are simply focusing on how you can set up your Metasoft product to handle the ICD-10 coding and claims. So, we do highly, highly recommend that you do get ICD-10 coding training through an accredited resource. And we're often asked who we would recommend for that. So some of the resources that we would recommend would be the AAPC, the AHIMA, and of course CMS. So there are, you know, I've noted on the screen there the websites that are available to you. Um, they all offer online training as well as um, some of the sites are going to offer to you live training as well. So with us getting so close to ICD-10 um, implementation deadline, those are really going to be a great place for you to start. And there's still time if you get on there to get some actual coding training specific to your specialty. So again, we highly recommend that. Little disclaimer, of course, is that um, we're going to give you all the information that, that we have about rules and regulations, but it really is up to individual practices to stay abreast of all the changes that are happening. But again, we're happy to share the information that, that we have and to try to keep you on top of that as well. So the IC10 deadline, I'm sure everybody is well aware now that it is um, coming quick and fast, October 1st, 2015. But there's still sometimes a misconception that we're just going to flip a switch and everything's good to go for IC10. So we're going to talk today about some of the challenges that practices may encounter um, when, you know, with that deadline and some of the, the rules around it. And again, the tools and features that are set up in Metasoft to help you navigate those changes. And I'm actually going to do a, a more of a deep dive to go in and actually show you how to set those things up in the program so you can be prepared from the, the software standpoint. There is, there is a lot more to ICD-10 than just your software uh, and software preparation, but if you are you know, if you've got your action plans together and things like that, this we are obviously your software is going to be one piece of the pie or one piece of your action plan that needs to be addressed. So that's what we're really focusing on today. So what are some of the exceptions? Well, there is an exception to the the October first deadline, and that is any of the non HIPAA uh, compliant payers, such as workers' compensation and auto insurance companies may choose not to implement ICD-10. In other words, they're not required to, you know, to implement ICD-10 on that October 1st date. Any of your other payers, obviously Medicare, Medicaid, your commercial payers are all going to be HIPAA compliant payers, so they are all going to be required to have that in place and for you to be sending ICD-10 coded claims to them come October 1st. But for the non-HIPAA compliant payers, it's really up to their discretion when to implement ICD-10. They're not required to implement it, so they may choose to continue to receive ICD-9 coded claims. Um, and you'll have to check with those payers really individually to stay on top of them if you are a practice that does do billing to these type of payers. So. 
Well, that is one of the exceptions. So what challenge does that create for billers? Well, the biggest challenge you're going to have is that if you do bill some of those and they have, they're not ready for ICD-10 or they're not going to implement it yet, then come October 1st, you may have some claims that need to be billed with ICD-9 codes, and then you may have other claims to all of your other carriers that need to be billed with ICD-10 codes. So how are we going to manage that? The other challenge that can also present is that you may run into scenarios where you have a primary insurance that is accepting ICD-10 claims and a secondary insurance that wants an ICD-9 claim and vice versa. So these were all things that had to be considered as, as the new features for ICD-10 were implemented into the software. Also, by way of clarification, I think this is um, even CMS in their reporting has shown that this is the biggest point of confusion among um, billers, and that is that the deadline for October 1st is based on the date of service and not on claim submission date. So what that means is any of your claims, regardless of when you actually send them in, if the date of service is prior to October 1st, then those claims are going to be need are going to need to be coded with ICD-9. Anything with a date of service after October 1st is going to be needed is going to need to be coded with ICD-10. So the challenge that can be presented because of that is that because it's not just a, a cutoff date where anything sent after October 1st will be ICD-10, you're going to have to manage um, claims that have dates of service prior to and after. So, you you know, if you don't bill, if, if you are entering charges for the dates in September, but you don't actually enter those charges into your system until sometime in October to get those bills out, then those claims are still going to have to go out with IC9 codes. So that's going to be the, the first real challenge with that. And then also anything, as you know, sometimes in the with insurance companies, you need to rebuild the insurance company. So if you are sending a rebuild claim for a date of service that, you know, if we're, if we're past that October 1st deadline and we're trying to rebuild claims for dates of service prior to October 1st, then the system's going to have to be able to handle those rebuilds to know to submit those rebuild claims with IC9 codes and not with IC10 codes. The other challenge that we have is, of course, um, hopefully all of you are well into your IC10 action plans at this point, but you have to learn your IC10 codes, modify your workflows, and do testing prior to that October 1st date. So, um, the challenge that that presents is that if you've got to learn these codes and do testing and everything else, you've got to get them in the system, yet at the same time still be able to maintain and send out claims that are coded under ICD-9. So that's going to be a, 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 that could present a challenge for us as well. So with all those things in mind, um, Metasoft luckily has gr some great tools built into the system to help you manage the change so that those challenges really become minimal. You're not going to have to manually try to keep track of, in other words, um, the dates and which claims need IC9 and which claims need IC10. You can start your testing. Um, you can start using IC10 codes today and still get claims out using IC9. So I'm going to jump into the program and show you the process that you need to go through to get the program set up for IC10. I am um, showing you, of course, our IC10 compliant version, which is Metasoft version 20. Metasoft version 19 is also going to include um, these features as well, so you will be able to, to see those if you have the, if you are on version 19 or version 20. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about, as, as we saw, the dates of service is one of the biggest things, and knowing whether or not your insurance needs to have an IC9 code or an IC10 code is essential when it comes to billing. So if you go to your insurance carrier list, you'll see that there is a new change that's been implemented on your insurance carrier. So if you open up your insurance carriers, 
one of your insurance carriers, you go to the option and then codes tab, you'll see that there's this new option that indicates diagnosis code set. So this is really where you indicate at the insurance level whether or not this insurance company wants IC9 codes or IC10 codes. Now we're still, you know, we're a month away, but we're still ahead of that, that date. So if you want to go ahead and start um, you know, sending out test claims or learning your ICD-10 codes, getting set up for ICD-10, then we're highly encouraging you to do that. And the way that you're going to do that with all of your insurances is you're going to set the, your diagnosis code set for this insurance as ICD-10, and then you're going to fill in the effective date. So this is going to, obviously I put in 10-1-2015 here, um, if it's one of my standard insurances that, that is going to need to start receiving um, ICD-10 codes on that date. So what the effective date does, for all of your, your major carriers, all of your uh, HIPAA compliant carriers, you can go ahead and set it right now to October 1st. What that effective date does is it, when you submit a claim, it's going to look at the dates of service on that claim, and based on that date of service and what the effective date is set at, it's going to know anything prior to the effective date to send ICD-9, anything after, on or after that effective date to send ICD-10, again, based on the date of service. So if you are, so for the majority of your insurance carriers, you should be able to go ahead and today go in and set that up for October 1st. If it is a carrier, like a work comp, that you're just not, you know, that's not taking ICD-10 yet, then you would want to leave the diagnosis code set as, as ICD-9. And then whenever that insurance sets a date for ICD-10, you would come in here and you would do the diagnosis code set as ICD-10 and, and put that insurance's specific ICD-10 implementation or effective date in there, and again, it will help you manage, the system would just automatically manage for you whether or not if the claim is going to be sent with IC9 or IC10. So that's one of the first fundamental changes to do is to make sure that your insurance is set up um, to overcome that first challenge, which is knowing which insurances are going to want IC10 and when they're going to want them, um, and that again is done at the, the individual insurance level. We were at least nice to you, though. Metasoft recognized that most of you have an extensive insurance list, so you are not going to have to edit these one by one. I wanted to show it to you at the individual level because as you are testing for individual payers, you may need to change that date for, while you're doing your testing, so I wanted you to know how to do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And of course, if you have to add a new payer to your system, you would want, just want to do it while you're adding that payer so it's important to understand that field and where it comes from. So I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm actually going to cancel that. So the nice tool that they gave you, because um, most of you are going to have a more extensive list than what I'm showing here, is if you go to your tools menu, you'll go down to your services, and you'll see this new tool called Set ICD Version. When you open that tool, that's going to show you all the insurances that are in your list. And I do want to point out, um, if you have set your insurance types up properly, then you can actually sort these fields just by clicking on type. So it would put, ideally, any of your work comp um, items together, uh, which may be important for you. So if, you, if you're not really dealing with any of the exceptions to the rule, you can simply come in here and say, I'm going to go ahead and set the, um, the code set, and we're going to set it for ICD-10, and then you'll see when you set that ICD-10, it's going to open up to say, hey, what do you want the effective date to be, and you're going to use the ICD-9 code set for dates of pr service prior to you. So this is where Again, at the global level, you could say, hey, I'm going to go ahead and set that all my claims are going to go ICD-10 for um, effective this data service. Down here, you could do a select all, so you could select everything all at once, or of course, you could tick them off individually. 
Um, you can also, of course, if maybe work comp wasn't going to be one of those, you could select that and, and undo it. I'm actually going to unselect this one, too, because I'm going to use that as part of my demonstration later. But So essentially, you're going to want to get all of them selected that you want to go IC10 effective that day, and then you can do the update selected. Um, and you'll see that it would fill in all those fields for you. Now, this particular one, I could go ahead and change to ICD-9 just on an individual level and update that selected one as well. So it would then update all my insurances in a really quick fashion instead of having to update them on an individual level there. So that's our ICD-10, the set ICD-10 version. Um, tool that's available to you, and you will, again, want to visit that and run that uh, as part of your ICD-10 setup. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close out of there. So the next thing, obviously, is how do we get set up for, how do we get our ICD-10 codes in there? Probably the biggest, most common question that we're getting in support right now. There are really five different ways that, that you can get those codes into your system, and I'm going to cover how to do each of those ways. So if you go to your diagnosis code list, then you'll see that there are some changes that, have, that are in the latest versions of Metasoft. So we now have, besides just our code columns, we have these columns for IC9 and IC10. Uh, I am going to pause for a moment because it is important. We did have early on in some of the Metasoft conversions, um, there was a problem occurring where when it would convert the data, it would actually drop the IC9 code into the IC10 field as well. So I'm going to pause for a moment and show you what that would look like. I'm going to open a different practice here. Um, And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how to resolve that. Because it's common enough, we've heard it enough now, that um, if you open your diagnosis code list and you see the same code, like your IC9 code also populated in your IC10 field, I would want you to take care of that before you do anything else with your IC10 code setup. Okay? So, there is a utility that you can run that will fix that problem. I'm going to recommend that you do a backup of your data before you run the utility. Always a good idea. So if you back up your data, I'm going to show you how to actually run that utility. Let me switch back over to my other practice here. OK, so the way that you can fix that issue, and it's really quick, is if you go to your desktop and you see your Metasoft icon, you can right click on that icon and go to your properties. And here it's going to tell you where that target location is located. And you're going to click on this option that says open file location. So that will open up the folder for the Metasoft bin. And then in the Metasoft bin, you can actually just search for clear and you'll find this little utility, sorry, clear IC10 utility. So to run it, you're just going to double click on that. And then it is going to ask you which practice you want to open. So if you do happen to have multiple data sets, you would need to run it for each one that's having the issue in. I'm going to open up medical practice. This is the one that I have a sample of um, the problem in. So what that will do is it will open up this clear ICD-10 utility. So you should get an extensive list of everything that's in there. And then you're simply just going to hit Start and then run that and close out of there. And then that will take care of that issue for you. So you should be able to then reopen up Metasoft and that those fields for ICD-10 code and the ICD-10 descriptions should be blank. And that's really going to be important because the other tools that are built into the system to help you manage ICD-10 are all dependent on knowing that you actually have, that there actually is an ICD-10 code in that field versus an ICD-9. All right, so let's go ahead and jump back into Metasoft here and go back to our 
diagnosis list. So again, if you if this field when you open it up is populated with IT9 data, make sure and run that utility. All right, so the change the the four ways that you can populate this list. As you know, when you buy it, when you purchase Metasoft, there it comes with a blank data set. So you, you would have at some point gone through a process of setting up codes, or if you're if you're brand new to Metasoft, uh, you may be going through that process right now. So the first way that you can populate your codes is through manual entry. So if I come in here and I just click New down at the bottom then it's going to allow me to set up my, my codes. Now code, which is this first field right here, code and description are really internal only. So anytime that you send a claim, it's never going to use, it's never going to pull code onto the claim itself. It's really an internal code to help you locate the right thing. So one of the advantages, of course, of uh, manually setting up the product or the, the code list is that it's really kind of like the the Burger King motto um, where you get your codes your way, right? So um, for the most part, I think as a best practice, most people have always set code as the actual ICD-9 code and as that actual description. Since we are now moving towards ICD-10, our recommendation is to go ahead and set that code as the ICD-10 code. So I'm going to go ahead and hit put R10.0 and put acute abdominal pain. So if I were just manually setting up the codes that I'm going to be using for ICD-10, you can come in here. There's a nice little handy tool right here that you can just say copy, and that indicates um, that this is the ICD-10 code. So this is the most important thing because how you fill these two fields out is how it's going to be sent on the claim form. So if I were using this code today and I did not choose any type of mapping, mapping meaning I'm going to map it back to what this would have been under IC-9, then this code that I have set up is only going to be good for any claims that I'm sending out with ICD-10. The benefit of setting up mapping is that you can then allow the system itself to manage um, manage the the claim for you. Meaning, I don't I can use my ICD-10 code regardless of whether I'm using um, whether I'm sending to work comp or not, or whether or not the carrier is accepting you know ICD-9 or ICD-10 or not, because I have a, a nine code map to it. Because really when you're setting up that effective date, the effective date is again telling it to pull from either this IC9 code field or this IC10 code field. So a best practice would be to try to have that, um, especially if you're still involved in testing and things like that and you're trying to implement IC9 ahead of the date, is to go ahead and map the code um, so that you can start using these codes now and it doesn't really matter what happens after that date, right? So I'm going to go ahead and put in, um, you could manually make the mapping if you knew that information as well. So I'm going to go ahead and put in uh, the ICD-9 code and description as well. Okay. So that's how you would, again, the very first option um, is just to manually set up your codes. Now obviously the downside of that is it is manual entry, so it's going to take some time. It may be time consuming for you need to set that, uh, you know, time aside for you to gather that information and to set those codes up. Um, the other downside is even today when I was trying to set up that test file to show you how to clear out the ICD-10 codes, there's human error. Like I, I made the mistake of keying one of the diagnosis code numbers wrong. So, and that was only doing a list of like 10 of them. So I can't imagine if I was trying to put in hundreds of codes, how easy it would be for me to, to make it a, a human error um, trying to populate that code. And again, the system is not going to, as long as there's a code in there, it's going to send it to the insurance. The insurance is going to reject it if, the, if it's just not a valid code. So, but that is your first option to go ahead and manually update your um, system with IC10 codes by setting them up. Second option that you're going to have is if you are converting your data or you already have an established 
uh, ICD-9 list in your system as I do here, then Metasoft took advantage of the GEMS, which are those general equivalency mappings that CMS produced to help with that IC10 transition. Um, and they've built those GEMS into the system. And even better, it's going to look at what you already have and suggest um, IC10 codes based on those GEMS. So I'm going to show you how you can use that tool as well. If you come up to your tools menu and you look at down at services, you'll see there's a create ICD-10 mappings tool. If you open that up, then this is the tool that you can use where the system will look at your existing codes. And if you're familiar with the GEMS at all, there are what they call one-to-one -one mappings as well as um, one-to-multiple mappings. So you'll see this first tab is just going to give you instructions. And then you'll see these other two tabs, which are really going to get you to um, the ability to create your, your new ICD-10 codes. So with your one-to-one -one mappings, um, you'll see that it's going to look at the code that you currently have in your system. And then it's going to suggest the ICD-10 code that is mapped to that code. This is a great time as we've been implementing practices. I've come across a number of them that just have old codes in their system that they no longer use. So it's a great time to kind of go through if you want to and just check the ones that you know that your practice still uses. So do a little bit of cleanup. Uh, that's an option for you. You can also come in here and just say, hey, select all, and then create selected codes, and that will create all of the those one-to-one -one mappings for you. I'm going to go ahead and just select one of them here, the food poisoning unspecified, and say create selected code. Um, it's going to tell me that that code was now created. You'll see that it did take it off my list for me. So that is kind of nice, because if you are going through any type of code cleanup or anything like that, you could actually um, you can actually close this and come back in, and it's not going to resuggest the same mapping to you. It's still going to only suggest mappings for codes that you have not mapped before. Um, I'm going to pause for a moment to come out of here just to show you what that did for me. So if I come into my diagnosis code list, there was my original code, the 005.9. And you'll notice that that code um, did, does not have a mapping included in it. So I do want to point out that the, it is not going to make any changes to any of your existing codes. If I was really trying to do my, um, if I was really trying to just rip that Band-Aid off and go full blown into IC10 at this point, I could open this up and just say, make this code inactive because I'm not going to use that one anymore. I'm just going to use my new code. And we, uh, we do have new features in your search capability. So if I only want to display the items that have the ICD-10 codes in them, then you can see that there. So this is the new code that it created. And if I open it up here, you'll see that it um, created the new code with the ICD-10 code. And there's my old ICD-9 code there. So because this one is mapped, then I can use it regardless of whether the insurance wants IC9 or ICD-10, and the system will know which one to pull. All right. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close out of there and also show you your under your services for create IC10 mappings, um, your other mappings. So in other mappings, this is where you may find that um, you know it's going to be somewhat common, right, for us to have what used to be one code. This is one of my favorite ones because it's so drastic. Um, Insect Byte used to just be one code under IC9. And then you can look and see all the, I feel like it was like 160 or something like that. It's a quite an enormous amount of codes under IC10 that that can explode into. So again, you kind of have the opportunity here to go ahead and say select all for all the code set underneath. If you're wanting to pull all 160 in, um, or you could deselect all, just choose the ones that you think might be um, used for your area. So, but those are those are some options in here, and it will do the same thing. Where if once I hit my create selected code, it's and I'm not actually going to do it for that one because I don't want to add that many. But here's a good one. So, 
Um, once I say create selected code, it's going to add those into my diagnosis code list for me as new codes. I do want to point out that um, the gems that are included in the system are only going to go to primarily your unspecified codes. So unlike Snakebite, there are a lot of codes under uh, the new ICD-10 features that include things such as laterality, like a left and a right, a bilateral, um, or the combination codes where you might have diabetes with some other manifestation. Those those combination codes or more detailed codes are not necessarily going to be included in these code mappings. It's really going to go just primarily to your unspecified codes, unless, of course, it's something like this, the insect bite, where um, it's just exploding into multiple codes that, that are not have anything to do with laterality and things like that. So I do want to point that out because I like to call the, the code mapping tool a good start. Like it's going to give you a baseline to start from, but there is a very high probability that you're going to need to add additional codes to your system in order to get more specific codes. So um, there are some there there are some other tools that, that I'm going to show you now that can help you build those additional codes. Along with that, I do want to point out that there is some, there is some a little bit maybe confusion around a recent um, ruling or update that CMS put out regarding ICD-10 and a grace period. So I'm going to pause for a moment to talk about that and also to show you some of the resources that are available to you. If you're not already familiar with our blog, you can go to www.azcomp.blog. And you can actually subscribe to our blog um, on the main page. So if you have not subscribed to our blog, this is really the best tool that we can use to communicate to all our practices about any changes that are happening or anything that's happening in the industry. So I do want to point out that um, we, we do pass this information down as soon as we receive that. So back in July, we made this post for you about the one-year grace period for IC9 with clarification of what that meant. And we usually try to include in there how that impacts Metasoft users. So, so on a good note, CMS announced, and this is for CMS only, so keep in mind that your individual, like your commercial payers and everybody else that you bill to is not necessarily going to follow these implement these same rules or guidelines. But for CMS, they realize that obviously this is a huge transition. Everybody's learning new codes, and the, they don't want to put everybody at financial risk. So they have, they have issued this one-year grace period that says that claims with nonspecific codes will still get paid. Um, and then they've included a few other things, such as if there's problems on their end, they're not going to delay processing those claims or anything like that um, due to issues related to ICD-10. So they're trying their best to make sure that you're going to get paid and you're going to get paid timely. I think the misconception, though, is that the grace period means that you could still submit ICD-9 claims. That is not the case. You still have to submit an ICD-10 claim come October 1st. What they're what they are allowing, though, is as long as that ICD-10 code is from the same code family. So, um, you know, if I have an injured toe, I could use that unspecified code under ICD-10 and still get paid, even if I didn't get really specific about, um, you know, whether it was the initial time that I've treated them for this or a subsequent time or whether it was the left or the right or whichever digit of the toe. So. I did want to point that out and again show you that we do have resources available that are that we're trying to get information out to you as quickly as possible. So subscribe to the blog if you haven't and you can always go here and search based off of any topic um, to find information on any articles that we've posted. So all right, so I'm gonna jump back into Metasoft here and close out of this.
and show you the, the two other options that we have for populating your codes into that diagnosis code list in your system. So these two options are add-on products. The manual entry and the mapping tool are included standard as part of your Metasoft package. But if you want more additional help populating your ic 10 codes, then there are two add-on products that are available to you. The first one I'm going to talk about is called Codes on Disk. So Codes on Disk will install as its own separate little program. So I'm going back to my desktop here so I can show you. I'm going to open this up. And you'll see that when Codes on Disk launches, it does include more than just your IC9 and IC10 codes. So you can do your CPT codes from here. Um, there is this also handy little tool called Procedure Manager that will actually um, help you take care of all of your pricing and costs in one easy screen and even increase pricing if you wanted to. So increase by a specific dollar amount, or you could say increase by 10% and go ahead and round up. So there are some other pretty cool features that are included in codes on this. But really for today, I'm just going to focus on how to get your ICD-10 codes in. So if you purchase codes on disk as an add-on product, um, typically this is a good tool for first-time users of Metasoft, anybody that's never set up any type of list or anything yet. Um, you can come into IC10, select that you're going to be importing all codes, select which practice you're going to be importing those codes into, and then you'll see that it's going to give you the entire library of IC10 codes. To point out another resource that's available to you, there's lots of um, websites and resources out there that really can help you focus more specifically on your practice specialty and the codes that, the code set of IC10 that you may, may be using. So even though we have you know, 68,000 codes in there, most likely you're still going to be using just a portion of those codes that apply to your specialty. Um, if you go to roadto10.org, um, I always like to point this, this website out to people. It's a free resource that CMS has put together, and they've got some pretty cool tools on there. Um, such as planning tools, if you're still, um, hopefully not, but if you're still in the ICD-10 planning phase of how to implement your practice, there's some tools that can help you with that. And then there's um, references by specialty, and they seem to still be putting these out. I seem to still be getting emails and notifications for them when they're adding new content, even for these uh, more specific references for specialty. So, if you go into any one of these, you can see they're going to have information on, because um, again, remember, I'm only focusing on that narrow portion of your ICT template, which is updating your software. But there are lots of other things that need to happen in your practice, such as um, tr you know the ICT-10 coding training, reviewing your documentation and your forms, and updating other things that are outside sometimes of the software itself. But in here, you can see there is a common code for a practice. And um, you can go through any of these and kind of see what, what that one code under IC9 may be under IC10. And they will give you some even case scenarios to help you even with your documentation for some of these as well. So, but I'm pointing that out, one, to show you that there are lots of resources available to you, and then also to show you how you may use some of those resources in conjunction with tools that we have available to you. So if I didn't want to load all my codes on disk, because one of the downsides of loading everything is it could ha impact your performance as you're trying to search for your code. So I don't necessarily recommend that you load every all 68,000 codes into your practice. Um, but you can focus on the ones that you might be using. And you can either, as you come through here, you can sort by descriptions or by the code itself. So if I wanted to maybe add these RO7.1 codes, I can quickly come down this list and just check off the ones that I want to include, right? And the benefit of that, of course, is that it's quick and efficient, and I'm getting accurate 
information, meaning I'm eliminating some of that human error of maybe coding something incorrectly. Um, the downside of codes on disk, or the cons to code on disk, is that it is not going to include any mappings. So you are going to get the IC10 codes that will create those into your system, but the IC9 field will be blank. So as we move more past that October 1st date, if you're one of those practices that um, isn't necessarily going to deal with insurances, um, or as we get past maybe some of the rebuildings and things like that, this is not going to be, this may be a, a tool that you would still want to consider and use to populate your ICD-10 codes. Um, other downside, of course, is um, just you're going to get it as sometimes if you're trying to search by just a clinical term, it's going to, you might not call, you might refer to something differently than how it's named in the system. So, so sometimes it can be harder to locate something in the way it populates it in the system for you is going to be based on how it's written in here. So, um, But anyway, that is a tool that's available to you. You can do a select all. You can kind of go through and pick out the common codes that you're going to use. And once you're done, you just hit merge. And that throws all those codes into the system for you. All right. So that's add-on option number one. The next option that we have available to you is called Encoder Pro. So Encoder Pro is really a, what I would call a replacement of your coding book. So if you are if you have not bought IC10 coding books, and those can be expensive in and of themselves, you're likely going to spend the same price just to get this product as you would to um, if not less, to buy the coding books. So my recommendation is just get this product because what Encoder Pro will do for you is the equivalent of what Google has done to, you know, trying to look something up in an encyclopedia, right? Within seconds, you can have, um, you can search and find instant information versus trying to thumb through a coding book. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. And the nice benefit of it is it's, it's integrated right into your software. So once you find that code, you're not having to rekey or do anything else. It's going to actually pull that code right into your software. So if I go into my diagnosis code list here and I hit New, when you have Encoder Pro installed, you'll see that on the right-hand side of the um, creating your diagnosis window, there will be a new button called Encoder Pro. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Encoder Pro to launch it and show you how it works. One of the cool features of Encoder Pro is that it uses lay description. So as I noted before, if I was trying to find, let's say, GERD, for example, most people would refer to it as GERD, but in any of your books or codes on disk or things like that, they may not use that description. They may use the full description of gastroesophageal reflux disease, right? So by searching for GERD, I can actually search either just in my IC9s or just in my IC10s. But regardless of which way I find it, I can. it's going to give me the ability to map my IC10. So when I say it replaces your coding books, um, if I were, and this is showing me my IC9 codes here, if I were to look in here, it's going to give me all the same information that I get in my coding book, such as, you know, what it, what's excluded, for example, all that, what you can't code with it. Or if I select this one, it's telling me, hey, you need an additional digit in order to use that code. Um, and if I do know, oh, well, from this exclusion, the, the benefit is it's all electronic. So if I need to jump over to one of these codes, I can actually just double click on it and it'll take me right there. There's a lot of other cool little features with Encoder Pro as well besides just the, the IC9, IC10 codes and the mapping. Um, it's going to include, um, it's going to include your CPT codes and some other cool tools for bookmarking and keeping in your own notes and things like that. But I'm going to show you how to 
basically find the code that you want. And you can see as I've selected this code, it's going to add that code down here at the bottom. And then since I happen to select an IC9 code, if I wanted to map it to my IC10 code, I just click on 10. And that's going to show me the, the mappings that are available for that. So I could select then, narrow down which one I actually need, and hit that mapping. And it's going to then populate my, both my IC9 and my IC10. And when I hit OK, that's going to populate right into Metasoft for me. So that's the benefit of having it um, integrated in the system. And what I really like about Encoder Pro is that if you have access to the full library and the full knowledge and everything that's, a, you know, all the benefits of Encoder Pro without having it clog up your, your actual diagnosis list. So I can keep just the codes that I've ever actually used to build with in my diagnosis list so I can keep my performance at optimum levels. So when I save that, it's just going to add that one code. Yet, it's only a few clicks away and I have all that availability to search and find any code that's out there and pull that into my system as I need it. So that's Encoder Pro. One of the best features, obviously, with that is the ability to use layman terms and to have the mapping um, included when you pull your codes in. Along with that, I want to show you um, there is a program option that you would want to turn on if you are using Encoder Pro, and that is found under your file menu. If you go to File, and then you go down to Program Options, when this opens up, you'll see that um, there is a HIPAA ICD-10 tab. So on that tab, it's going to say default new diagnosis version. So if you leave this as ICD-9, when I create, when you create any of your codes using Encoder Pro, then your internal code right here is going to be populated with the ICD-9 code instead of ICD-10. So again, my recommendation is let's just get used to ICD-10 because it's here. So Go ahead and change that to ICD-10, and then you'll be able to, um, it will create that code, that internal code as an ICD-10 code. All right. Um, before I leave this screen, some other things just to point out is that there are other new features available in this screen. So you can search for um, partial matches now by checking this field, and um, you can search off of any of these fields that are available to you. One of the, one of the nice things, too, as you're going through this transition, if you're, even if you've populated all these ICD-10 codes, you might find that if I had pulled in that one for, um, for insect bite, for example, um, you can search based off of, if I wanted to, I could search off of that IC9 code field itself. And then I can still find my IC10 codes that are pulled in because as I search for that code under IC9, it would show me all the IC10s that I've got in my system that are mapped to that one single code. So it'll still, again, help you with that transition. That's one of the other nice little features that are in there. All right, so I'm going to close out of the diagnosis code list, and we're going to, I'll, talk, I'll just point out the fifth option that you have available for you. For any of our EHR users, like if you're using Metasoft um, Clinical or our web-based EHR, uh, McKesson Practice Choice, and you are capturing charges in your EHR and in your diagnosis along with those charges, both of all of our EHR options are already um, set with all the IC10 codes and the mapping to IC9. So at point of documenting your encounters, you should be capturing that information. And if you are transmitting that information over from your EHR into Metasoft, um, then that would be sending over to this activities menu to your unprocessed EMR charges. So, and I'll just put it here as a little date. 
you can see. So under your unprocessed transactions, any of that data that is coming over, if you transmit over an ICD-10 code that and every code that you send over will be mapped to an ICD-9, and that code is not already in your diagnosis list in Metasoft, then it will go ahead and create that code for you with that ICD-9 code mapped for you. So that is one other way to get your um, list populated is by simply sending the charges over from your EHR if you're using one of our uh, EHR offerings. If you are using those offerings, then that program option that I just pointed out to you under program options, um, hit the IC9, you would also want to set that so that any of those new codes that are created by the charges that are sent over will populate as the internal code as ICD-10 if you're trying to move over to ICD-10. All right, so that really sums up some of the setup that you're going to need to do in order to get ready for ICD-10, and I'm going to uh, just reiterate again, or just review the biggest question that we get, which is how do you populate the codes? Those are our five options that we have available to you. Um, the manual entry again, your code's your way, but it may be time con it is the most time consuming option and there is room for human error. You can also use that IC10 mapping tool. Um, the pros again being it's going to look at the codes that you already have and then recommend the ICD-10 codes to pull into your system and create them for you based on um, the gems that are available. It's quick and easy, and it's a great start. The only con to that product is that it may not be enough. So it's only going to map the unspecified codes, and you may need more. Even with this grace period, the grace period is really given to you as an opportunity for you to learn your ICD-10 code. So you wouldn't want to put yourself in a position where you're waiting a whole year again to just still use unspecified codes when you should be using that year to start learning and getting better and more proficient at um, coding the more specific codes. And again, CMS has implemented that rule, but individual insurances, it's up to their discretion how they're going to handle um, reimbursement based off of those codes. So codes on disk was the other add-on option for you. That one gives you the bulk import option, and it does include additional features. The only downside of codes on disk is really that it does not include any of the mappings between IC9 and IC10. With Encoder Pro, um, the, there's a lot of upsides with Encoder Pro. It's integrated directly in Metasoft. It's going to replace your coding book, so you don't even have to make an investment in those. It is going to include code mapping, and it's super easy to search because you get those lay term options. Um, there's a lots of other additional features with it as well. Um, the only real con with Encoder Pro is that they're going to ha you do have to look them up and import them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But on the upside, you always have that entire library available to you, and you're just only pulling in the codes that you need. One other thing to point out is that right now, if you are interested in moving to a, a monthly subscription for Metasoft, where you no longer have to worry about um, paying for you know, upgrades or installations or data conversions, you just know that you have that peace of mind, you're always covered, um, you just pay one low monthly fee, we are including the Encoder Pro for free as part of that monthly subscription bundle. So if you're interested in that total peace of mind offering, then you can talk to yourself about to get more information on um, what that would look like for your practice. And then the last option, again, is if you are using one of our EHR products, um, then you can transmit the charges over from the EHR, including the diagnosis, and it will, as if you are sitting in the any transactions that have diagnosis codes that you've never built for before, it will create those codes in the system for you. So let's move on to talk a little bit about ICD-10 testing and what that process looks like. Um, we are 
you know, really close to the deadline at this point. We're within 30 days. So I, I'm just going to be honest that testing has been open for two years now, and your ability to fully test may be very limited. But it's still important to uh, visit, and it's super important to know prior to October 1st whether your claims are going to um, at least be accepted with the, the codes that are on them. So there is a really a four-step process to that. You need to make sure that your practice management system is ready. Then you need to check um, to see which payers are still offering testing or who you can test with, or even just if you can simply just test with your clearinghouse. Um, most payers have offered um, testing, obviously, throughout this, these last two years. Um, some payers did select just a select group of physicians to test with. Uh, so they may not even allow you to test with them, but most clearinghouses, even if you can't test directly with the payers, will allow you to at least test directly with the clearinghouse to make sure that they're at least getting the ICD-10 data um, sent over properly on the claim. So you need to check and see who is available to test with or, um, you know, check with your clearinghouse to see what options you have at this point. And then we'd highly encourage you to submit test claims and then obviously monitor the results on that so you can make adjustments in your practice as necessary. This has been a big issue that's come up uh, recently as people have been doing their testing. And that is you need part of that first step was to make sure that your system is ready. Everything I showed you in Metasoft as far as Metasoft system setup is is going to be required for you, but then beyond that, you also need to verify the method that you're using to send claims to the clearinghouse. Recently, we've had um, calls from people that are actually still somehow submitting on a print image format. So I do want to kind of touch on that for just a minute here. Back in January of 2012, hit the passed the requirement or implemented the requirement um, that anything past that, as of that date, needed to be submitted in the ANSI 5010 format. So probably many of you remember that tr transition back in 2012 and went through the process of getting ready and are totally fine and already sending your claims in the 5010 format. Metasoft includes the capability to submit ANSI 5010 directly from the program. So that's how we're compliant with that rule is you're not, you don't have to rely on anybody else. You can actually submit ANSI 5010 claims directly from the program, whether you want to go directly to a payer or um, to a clearinghouse that's accepting that. Now, prior to all this time, really the, the legacy way to submit claims before even you know, any of the ANSI formats was to submit what they call the print image, and then the, the clearinghouse would basically take that and convert it. So most clearinghouses discontinued supporting print image when the new claim form was released last year. So before April 1st of 2014, we had a slew of people that were still using print image format that went through the process of um, they got letters from their clearinghouses saying, hey, we're no longer supporting it. And they went through the process of updating their system to start sending claims in the ANSI 5010 format that's included in your program. So we are finding, though, that there um, are a handful of, of clearinghouses that might have still been accepting um, print image formats. But it's important for you to know that the print image file, basically what a print image is, is it's basically submitting a file that is um, the claim form, and then the, the clearinghouse is mapping to that to the different fields on the claim form, and then they're, they're interpreting that or, or transmitting it, uh, converting it to ANSI 5010 and sending it out for you. The, the claim form for the CMS 11 file that's used in Metasoft in order to create that print image was never changed 
um, to accommodate the new claim form that went into effect last year. So if you are still using CMS11.exe to send your claim, then you are in effect sending the old claim form. That claim form was never touched or changed to update for the new field, nor was it ever touched or changed to pull the ICD-10 codes onto the form. So remember, prior to version 19, we didn't even have the ability to have to know. We just had that internal code, and uh, the diagnosis code setup was different. So we couldn't identify that this field is an ICD-9 code and this field is an ICD-10 code. So the program has never, that claim form has never been updated to look at the ICD-10 field in your diagnosis code setup to pull the ICD-10 code. So it might have been possible for you to still be submitting ICD-9 codes um, and, and to get those processed, but we are getting, we, we have had a handful of people again call to say that um, as they're doing their testing, things are failing in their testing even though they've got all their, their Metasoft set up properly. And what we're finding is that they're somehow still sitting on that old print image format. So it's important for you to figure that out and figure out quick because you do not want to be at the end of the line when October 1st comes both at your clearing house at the end of the line and, and with your vendors or your payers or anything else. It's, you do not want to be at the end of the line to get things updated or to contact your clearing house or to contact payers or to be getting your claims denied. You want to know that as soon as possible so that you can make the necessary changes to make sure your claims are still going to be sent, um, sent through and processed with the IC10 codes on it. So, if you are still using print image con um, print image format to submit claims, please contact your clearinghouse immediately. You will need to you will most likely need to convert off of print image to send to them in the ANSI 5010 format, um, which is going to require some coordination with the clearinghouse because they they need to know that you're switching their format off of print image. And in addition to that. Even though Metasoft includes the software to send your print, sorry, to send in the ANSI 5010 format, like there's no additional software you have to buy, you do have to configure your software, which is called Revenue Management. It's the module inside of Metasoft that will send it that way. You do have to configure that software with specific settings for the um, the either the payer that you're sending to, if you're sending directly, or to the clearinghouse that you're sending to, so that, they, that they're getting the proper information um, on their side. So I know I probably spent a lot of time on that screen, but it's such an important and critical piece to understand as you're getting ready um, for sending your claims. So the next thing that you're going to need to do is, um, once you know that Metasoft is set up properly, you know you're sending it in the ANSI 5010 format or that you're sending it in the format that your clearinghouse is going to accept, then, then you're ready to submit your test claim. So the way that you're going to do that is you're going to need to edit your payers. So typically you're going to choose a payer to test for and you'll need to go in and edit your payer to temporarily change the effective date. Then you'll need to put revenue management, which is the the module that I was referring to that allows you to send your claims in that ANSI 5010 format. You'll need to put revenue management in test mode, and then you'll enter in some of your test claims, and you're going to submit claims as you normally would um, through revenue management. And then once those claim, test claims are processed or you've sent them out, then you're going to need to go back and undo that process. You'll need to go back into revenue management, take it out of test mode, and then go back and change that payer that you're sending the test claims for, change that effective date back to the, the October 1st, 2015 date for your payers. Um, so I'm going to pause for a moment because I know I did a lot of talking and just using text, and I want to show you in the program to make it a little bit easier for you. So the first thing I'm going to show you is how to identify whether or not you're sending a print image format 
uh, to your payers or not, or to your clearinghouse. So if you go into claim management right now, if you are if you are processing your th claims through claim management by doing print send, and you're choosing electronic right here, when you choose your EMC receiver, it should show you which program file that you are using. But if you are using this method at all to send electronically, you'll notice that when I hit OK, it is going to tell me that I am using a print claim format. So print claim form. Okay? And it may even tell you that you're using CMS 11 up here. So if you're using this method, this is the method that I'm referring to that is not supporting ICD-10. This is not going to produce your ICD-10 claims, or this will not produce ICD-10 codes on your claim for you. It's essentially just producing that old claim form. It was never updated for, um, for ICD-10. All right. What is included, again, in your system, though, is if you go to your activities menu and go to revenue management, revenue management is the module that will send your claims electronically in the ANSI 5010 format right from the software. And it's really going to be, you know, there's so many advantages that you'll find by using revenue management. There's claim scrubbing that happens before claims even leave the system. and there is ERA posting, so we can read ERA files back and actually post them to you to reduce your posting time and things like that. So there really are, and even on the support side, it's a lot easier for us to support you when you're sending an ANSI 5010 because we can get really specific if there's a problem to understand like which loop and segment was denied and know exactly how to help you and how to fix it. So. Um, it is really the standard that you should be using. And just, again, to point out, Metasoft does not support print image format, so we're not going to be able to help you, if you if, as, when it comes to IC10 if you're still trying to use print image. So now that I'm in revenue management, I'm going to show you how to put revenue management in test mode. So if you go up to your configure menu, and then you go down to your receivers here, You'll see you're going to find the receiver that you're um, using to send your, your claims. Like if you're using Relay Health, it's our recommended a clearinghouse of choice because we can actually support you end-to-end -end on it. It's the only one that we can. Um, so it's probably our most commonly used one. So you're going to find your receiver, and then you're going to come down to this column called Transactions. and when you click on the drop down for transactions, you'll see that there is a field right here called test mode. So you'll simply check that off and then close out of that. And you'll hit save right here. And now revenue management is now in test mode. So any claims that you have ready to send um, are going to be sent in that test mode. And then once you set those claims, you're going to go back into the receivers and hit that drop down and take it out of test mode so that you can send all your other claims. So, and also just as a reminder, you do want to make sure that the transactions that you enter in those test claims for, so let's just say that I'm going to enter in test claims um, that have dates of service as September 4th um, on there and I'm going to send those test claims to Aetna, I would want to come into Aetna, and I would want to change my um, options and codes temporarily for Aetna to September 4, 2015, so that I could send those test claims out, and it would pull the IC10 codes as opposed to um, the IC9 codes on there. So just keep that in mind. Those are really the only steps you need to take in order to produce the test files is to Make sure that you have an effective date that is uh, going to allow the dates of service that you, you enter to pull the, the IC10 codes on it, put revenue management in test mode, and then it will allow you to produce and send the file for your test claims, and then go back and reverse that out. Okay. One other little feature that I um, did not point out to you that is available to you to help you through this transition is when you are in transaction entry, 
there are some new features that as you're trying to manage, you know, your different pairs and which ones are nine and which ones are ten and which dates of service you're on and what codes it should be sending, um, the system is going to help you with that. Because if I were, if I come down here, let's just say I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna post for Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, and I'm gonna enter in a transaction for today. Uh, if you're not already familiar, when you're in with when you're in the diagnosis field, if you hit F6 on your keyboard, that will actually give you it'll bring up your search window to search for your code. So if I happen to be um, past the effective date and I happen to choose one of my old codes out of my system to put it in, you'll see that it's going to highlight that field in red for me. So it's giving me what we call an, an diagnosis warning. So it's looking at my insurance and it's looking at the effective date for my insurance and it's telling me, hey, we have a problem here because, you know, I need to be pulling, in this case, an ICD-10 code and you have not entered in a code that has a mapped ICD-10 code to it. So um, if you ignore that warning when I try to save that transaction, it will tell you again that, hey, you are using a diagnosis code that is not valid for the insurance that you're submitting to and it will ask you if you still want to continue or not. If I, if I don't want to continue, um, I can easily just edit that diagnosis right there and add the ICD-10 code if I want to add it in there or I can just switch the diagnosis code to a valid code so it's not highlighted in red. But I'm going to skip all that and just say, hey, I do want to go ahead and save that transaction anyway. Um, we are going to give you one more warning. Um, well, actually, you're not going to be able to send your claim at all. So if I come into claim management at this point and I create my claim in here, you'll see that that claim did create. However, there's a new status in claim management, which is this one is not ready to send. It has a diagnosis error on it. If I go to my transactions tab, it will actually have highlighted in red the diagnosis that is causing the problem. So you could go and correct that. So did just want to point that out that, um, that that is available. So even as you're sending your test claims, if you were to enter a, um, a date of service and you hadn't changed your effective date, you would still get those error messages to show you that, hey, your test claim isn't set up properly um, for it to pull the ICD-10 right now. All right. so. That is the little scenario on um, submitting your test claims to your payers. Um, just to give you a little bit more information about what testing is available. Again, so close to deadline, you may be really limited in what you can still do. Um, but these are the, the different types of testing that are typically going to be available to you. And these are the ones that Relay Health offers. Um, the first one is going to be validation testing. The second one is true end-to-end -end testing. And the third one is self-supported payer testing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means. Validation testing um, simply means that you're going to be able to submit a claim to uh, the clearinghouse, and they're going to perform a validation test to simply say, yes, we got it. It's, you know, the format is proper, we can see the IC10 code on it, and we should be able, you know, we will be able to forward this on to the payer. So it, it's really the minimal testing that you could do just to confirm that, hey, they can at least get my IC10 codes. I, if that's your only option left at this point, I would still encourage you to do it because, again, some of those other things that um, you don't want to find out after October 1st is, hey, my, my, I'm, not, I'm sending in a print image format that's not even sending an ICD-10 code on it, and even if you do have revenue management configured, I, there is a chance that you have a custom configuration, and if you have a custom configuration, um, when you upgraded your software, it did not automatically it will not touch any custom configurations. It only touches um, the standard configurations to update them for ICD-10. So you may still have to tweak even your uh, revenue management uh, settings 
in order to get an IC tag coded claim properly formatted out to your clearinghouse repair. So validation testing, even if that's the only option that you have left, it's still very worthwhile your effort to try to do it at this point. Just so you can confirm, hey, they can accept my IC tag code and you're not, again, at the end of the line when everything happens on October 1st, finding out that, hey, you have a problem. End-to-end -end testing, if there are any payers left that are still offering this, this is really your best choice um, because this really gives you the detailed information that you would want to know, not just if the clearinghouse can accept it, but end-to-end -end testing means they actually can forward it to the payer. The payer uh, will look at that claim and they will actually return a report to you. So all the same reports that you get today under IC9, it's going to go end-to-end -to, -end to test it in IC10 to make sure you can get the report back. And most valuable piece of data is if they can return that remittance, remittance advice report where you can actually see um, not just that they accepted a, a IC10 coded claim, but if you were to submit a claim that was, you know, um, for procedures that you had to do because of a certain diagnosis, you would actually be able to see what your reimbursement would be on that. So making sure that it was properly coded so that you could get the same re reimbursement that you're expected to. So end-to-end -end testing is really the, uh, the best testing that you could do if it is still available. Unfortunately, at this point, most payers have closed their end-to-end -end testing. I know Medicare is no longer accepting any end-to-end -end testing. Um, they're only offering that validation or acknowledgement testing at this point. Um, but if it is available, if you see any payers um, still that are offering it, then uh, I would highly encourage you to, to try to do that if there's still time. And then the last option is self-supported testing. This means that some payers were not allowing testing through the clearinghouses. You had to go directly to the payer through their portal on site, or sorry, online. So you'd have to create a file and then um, instead of sending it through your normal channels like you would electronically, you had to load that file up to their site. So um, again, even this at this point may be limited because we're so close to the deadline. A lot of the testing window has been closed, but that is another option that may still be available to you. All right, and then the last step in your process, if you are able to still test, is to monitor any results that you get back um, so that you obviously are aware uh, after you submit your test claims of whether or not there were any issues with it. Um, we do offer one-on-one -on -one training. Our schedules are very packed right now, but we still have one-on-one -on -one training slots available. So if you need individual help on getting things set up or walking you through testing or anything like that, um, we do have trainers that are able to assist you with that. You would want to contact your sales rep for more information. Um, the other important thing, obviously, is to work with support. If you're not already on a support contract, I highly recommend you get on a support contract as you're going through this ICD-10 transition. Um, we strive to provide phenomenal support to our customers, and we really have a we do have a phenomenal support team here that is well versed in. Metasoft in the clearinghouses and the challenges that you may be facing. So it will be key as we're making this transition that if any issues arise that we that you report those to us through support so that we can get you resolutions as soon as possible. Um, with that said, I do want to point out that really we're all kind of going to be somewhat in a beta mode as we get to that date that there are some payers that didn't even offer testing and there are, you know, it's a big unknown, right? Everybody's waiting for October 1st, holding their breath. You are, we are. Um, Any time that we've gone through any of these big transitions, whether it was MPI or the, the transition to ANSI 5010, in our experience, there's always tweaks that need to happen in the system. There might be pairs that require something specific that if that has to go back to development and they have to put out a service pack or an update for it, just be aware that those service packs are only going to be released for version 20. So 
if you are on version 19, technically you are compliant for for ICD-10, but that version was written, you know, that version was written for that October 1st, 2014 deadline. Newer version has come out since then, and only the new version will be supported if there are any changes that are required from pairs. So um, one thing to point out is if you always stay on the current version, you actually pay the least amount for your product. So if you are one of those that does an, the upgrade every other year type thing or every two years type thing, you actually end up paying more than if you just stay current. So it's actually a really nominal fee to get on ICD, or sorry, on version 20 if you're already on version 19 compared to if you wait till um, version 21 next year to upgrade. So, and we are offering those subscription packages, packages now as well. So if you're not even on um, 19 or 20 period, or if you're on 19 wanting to get on 20, um, instead of taking that cost all up front, you can get on a, one of our monthly subscription packages, which will give you that total peace of mind because it's going to include the support, the installation, the training, all the upgrades, and Encoder Pro, um, and it is a 12-month contract for you. So um, as those updates, though, are released, and, um, you know, we do somewhat anticipate that every version is going to have an update, especially when there is such a significant change happening in the industry. So as those are released, we do post those on our website. So if you go to ASCOP.com, under the technical support area, you will see the Metasoft downloads and registration right there. And then lastly, I know I pointed it out before, but um, any updates that happen, any the you know, it makes me sad when I hear that people are frustrated because they didn't know that there was a service pack that was released or anything like that. We do our best. We do newsletters that are mailed to you. Um, we try to send the emails out, things like that. But the best thing that you can do is if you, uh, there are some restrictions on us as to what we can and can't do as far as notifications. But if you give us permission to notify you, then you absolutely will get those notifications. So what you will want to do if you're not already subscribed is to go to ascop.com forward slash blog. Every time there is a service pack or a hot fix or any industry news that may impact your practice, we are posting it there. So if you are subscribed to the blog instead of having to go and check the blog regularly, if you subscribe to the blog, which you could do right at our, at our home page, um, just right when you go to ASCOMP.com forward slash blog, you'll see this button to enter your email address and subscribe. You will automatically get emailed to you um, any of those notifications. So that's really the most efficient way that we can um, make sure that you're aware of any changes as they're occurring or any notifications or alerts or big news that's happening in the industry. So with that said, um, thank you so much for joining us. If you have any additional questions, you can call us at 877-544-4433. Again, that uh, link to where you can get to us on our blog is ASCOMP.com forward slash blog. Uh, I really did a summary of a compilation of uh, webinars that we have um, offered in the past uh, or bonus webinars and things like that. Try to condense it all in just to one video that you can watch. Um, but if you, if you need more detail on ICD-10, we do have a full webinar series that is available to you. And again, if you were interested in any of those uh, Metasoft subscription bundles um, that give you that total peace of mind by offering the upgrades, installation, data conversions, uh, our phenomenal support, and um, right now for a limited time, the Encoder Pro included with it you can contact your sales rep to get more information on pricing and things for that. So thanks again for joining us, and good luck as you make this move to uh, ICD-10. Hey, thanks for watching. Hope you liked the video and found it helpful. If you did, let us know by giving us a thumbs up by clicking on the like button below. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, feel free to write those in the comment section below. And if you want to get more helpful videos like this one, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Thanks.